Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. So fix my microphones or my headphones here a little bit. So let's get started with our next session. So I'd like to welcome Rob Lee, principal and founder of Leeway Engineering Solutions, and Nikki Pozos, principal and founder of the Formation Lab. So their session is entitled, Putting the Why Before the How. Fundamentals Pacific Northwest leaders should know about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Nikki and Rob, take it away. Thank you. Um, and you can go to the next slide. So we just wanted to start out telling you a little bit about ourselves, kind of outside of our normal professional introduction. So um, this is me on the left as a baby. That's my mother. Um, my mother was born in Myanmar and grew up in England. And uh, my father was poor, white, and rural in Canada. And as a mixed race person who can pass as white, it's really been a journey to kind of own the brown part of me. And I've found that to be a very common um, challenge for people who are mixed race. And one of the interesting things about me is that almost all brown people recognize immediately that I'm mixed race and almost all white people are quite surprised that I'm mixed race. So it's kind of like I'm brown to brown people and white to white people. So just another interesting thing to note. So I'll let Rob take it. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. So the picture on the right, that little boy, the, the chubby little kid in the blue shirt, um, that's me. Um, I was born in the United States in Ames, Iowa to immigrant Koreans, uh, moved to Oregon when I was two. And, and really, uh, that was a, a very formative thing, um, being uh, in, a, in a state that had very, very few people of color. I was the only non-white in my elementary school. And this entire journey that I've been on in discovering and, and advocating for diversity uh, has been interesting as I look back on how our, our backgrounds, our experiences, our history shapes who we are. And so as we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and I know that many people who are participating in this are excited about doing more within the water industry, um, bringing more into your own individual organizations. We thought it would be important to start off by getting to a little bit of that history. And so next slide. We're gonna try to have you drink out of a fire hose for a little bit. Um, I am gonna try to cover 250 years of US legal political history in around seven and a half minutes. Um, and it's, I'm gonna talk fast. It's not because I just had a lot of coffee, but it's a lot of material to cover. Um, so starting off, just wanted to, to highlight from the very beginning of the United States, as we know it, um, there was some laws and, and practices put into place. And I'm gonna really focus on, on the legal system as, as it pertains to race. So beginning of the early parts of our country, the three-fifths compromise, when they were figuring out how to account for all of the blacks in America, rated them as three-fifths of a person uh, in order to count them for population. Uh, with the Naturalization Act, that only whites could be naturalized citizens. And then over the years, the decades following that, we started to see more and more people of mixed heritage, ultimately culminating in the Dred Scott decision, which very clearly said that those of African descent could not be citizens of the United States. Again, focusing on our history and why that's important as we think about diversity moving forward. Um, what did all this mean? Well, the bottom line is ultimately that citizenship um, was the key to social equality. And at the very beginnings of our nation's existence, citizenship was, was denied to folks based on their appearance, based on their heritage. And why was citizenship important? Well, it's the right to vote, the right to due process, um, the right to a fair and speedy trial, to serve on a jury. Those are all things that were denied people just purely based on their appearance and where their, their ancestry came from. Ultimately, it led the United States to a place of civil war um, with the Emancipation Proclamation and some constitutional amendments that abolished slavery, that, that granted citizenship to anyone born or naturalized in the United States, and, and even clarifying the right for all citizens, the right to vote. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that was great. It seemed like, okay, we're maybe turning a little bit of a corner in, in terms of our racial history, but that led to uh, a whole new set of laws and regulations. Um, in the late 19th century, the, the passage of Jim Crow laws, which really enforced legal segregation, and again, segregation based on appearance, uh, based on, on heritage. 
Um, and what was interesting at this time was even the way they defined uh, race. Um, and, and in many ways, we think of race now, we fill out the census and we click off the box of what our race is. Um, but even back then they had different laws depending on what state you're in. So for instance, Virginia, you could have 1 16th African heritage and still be considered white. But if you went down to Florida, if you had more than 1 8th African heritage, you were considered black. Um, if you went to Alabama and had a single drop of African blood in you, you were considered black. Again, that's what enforced these legal segregation laws. And what's interesting is that the concept of race was even defined by geography, that you literally could go from one state to another and change what race you were. Um, so when we think about the, the concept of race, the history of the United States, even after the Civil War, uh, showed that there were continued to be laws put in place that, that were defining politically uh, who people were based on skin color and heritage. Um, next slide. That continued moving into the 20th century. Um, we had a number of laws passed in the early 20th century, the alien land law that prohibited any non-citizen from owning or leasing land. Um, there were a couple key Supreme Court rulings that were made at this time. This is again, well after the Civil War, well after the, the 14th uh, Constitutional Amendment. Um, there was a Japanese American who, who ended up bringing a case before the Supreme Court. And they, as a Japanese American, he was being denied citizenship. And the Supreme Court ended up with a ruling that said only those of a Caucasian descent could be citizens. And because he was of Mongolian descent, he could not be a citizen. A few months later, there was another case brought to the Supreme Court uh, by an Indian American who, at the time, uh, some of the, the genealogy showed that Hindus were actually of Caucasian descent. And so he brought his case to the Supreme Court. And then they came back and said, well, white is actually more subjective and defined by the general population, by the common man. And what was interesting about these Supreme Court rulings, the law of the land, that after these decisions that many Americans at that time of different uh, backgrounds, different heritage, different appearances were stripped of their property. They were stripped of their, their businesses because they were no longer citizens and therefore no longer allowed to own the properties that they had previously been owning. Um, so again, citizenship was being granted even well after some of the early history of, the, uh, of America granted exclusively to whites at, at the expense of non-whites. Uh, next slide, please. One of the great things we started to see though is as people became more and more aware of some of these things, there was a, a, a turning in our country and really uh, post-World War II. Um, we saw the passage of the Immigration and Nationality Act, which repealed some of these immigration bans. Some of that post-World War II nationalistic sentimentality that really united the country, um, leading into the civil rights movement, where finally laws were being uh, pulled back that, that did things like poll taxes, where literally if you came to a poll and tried to do what most of us did a few weeks ago and vote, that they would charge you a day's wages or more just for that right to submit a ballot. And so we were seeing the country start to, to take a little bit of a turn. Um, next slide, please. But one other interesting thing that was happening in this post-World War II era was uh, this entire housing boom. We had all these returning GIs coming back from World War II. And, and at that time, it, it es in essence created what is, we know today as our suburbs. This entire huge housing burst where over $120 billion were made in new housing loans. But even though there were over a million returning black GIs, less than 2% of that money uh, went to non-whites. Why? Part of that reason was the national appraisal system, which said that any neighborhood that had those of, that were integrated, those of a different race, um, those who have a different background were deemed higher risk and therefore ineligible for some of these loans. Uh, next slide, please. And many folks on this call probably will have heard the term redlining. I mean, that was the beginning of this entire redlining. Neighborhoods were outlined in red that were considered higher risk. Um, and and th that information was made available to 
the public as well as those trying to finance loans. And what we saw here was this entire idea of race, not just being a political construct, but a social construct. Um, what was happening as a result of all of this, uh, this redlining was white flight. Uh, we saw many whites leaving these integrated neighborhoods. As soon as a person of color would move in, people would move out. House values, property values would decline. And as a result, we saw uh, the, the quality of the schools and social services also decline. What does that mean? Well, even from the, the mid 20th century, the ability to uh, accumulate wealth and equity was politically and socially challenging for those of, of a different background. And really when we think about it, a lot of times that ability to accumulate wealth finances the, the education that we give to the next generation. So again, this transition of race becoming from simply just a political construct to now a social construct. Okay, so that was a lot. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. The reason why it's so important is I do think it is really important to understand where we come from. Um, as I grew up in Oregon, the entire idea of I was different and I didn't want to be different. I wanted to be like everyone else. Um, but when we think about trying to bring um, diversity, equity, inclusion into our organizations, it's important to define what racism is. And so racism is not simply just a few acts of bad people, some bad apples wearing white hooded masks and, and burning crosses. It is that. But to understand and recognize that racism is also a political and social construct that was really created uh, around this purpose of consolidating power and wealth into a majority culture. And it was based on this idea of white supremacy. And Gosh, I'm sure that even in the audience, there is reactions to me saying that word. It's almost probably as hard for you to hear it as it is for me to say it. But it's this idea that whites are superior to non-whites and in many ways that non-whites are subhuman. I would say today, racism, well, we could then take that to continue to ignore or deny that that system has been in place and continues to be in place that accounts for racial differences really important to think about this as we think about how we bring uh, a change to the water industry. So next slide, please. And I would say this, as we start thinking about where we've been, where we're coming from, um, to move people, individuals, because this work is all about individuals. Uh, it's a really challenging journey because it comes at the very core of who we are. I wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror and I can't change the fact that I'm Korean, um, that my eyes look a certain way, that I got these skin spots that, that show up when I spend too much time in the sun, um, that I'm never gonna be 6'4". Um, there are just things that I cannot change and that's the core of who I am. And that goes to the same for anyone else when we talk about racial differences. And so there's this journey that I believe every single person goes on and it's important as leaders who are trying to bring change within our industry and within our organizations to think and understand what that journey might entail. So next slide. First, I think it's really critical of this encounter piece um, to understand and gain this common background around where we've come from, how, we, where, how we've gotten to the place that we are now. Um, maybe it's just that seven minutes of US history, or it's this, there's so much great material out there, but it's helping people within our organizations understand this racial journey. Second is this step in the process when people first come in encountering this, this topic, oftentimes we'll find people go through this stage of denial and disorientation. Um, that, hey, that was, that's not me. That's all history from way long before I was even born or this disorientation like, wow, what are you talking about? This is not what I have known to be my America. And it's important for us to understand that people will go through this stage anytime they encounter something new in this racial journey, and that's okay. It's our job as leaders to help them through that stage. Next slide, please. Then to recognize that sometimes the conversation leads to shame. And I, I say that because I go through that all the time. Um, when we talk about racial conversations, when we talk about race, 
it almost always leads us to talking about privilege, talking about power. And, and uh, the rapper Jay Quest defines privilege as the ability to walk away. Um, and so I, as in the place that I'm currently at, I, I think I do have the ability to walk away. I can put down this topic and just pick it back up when I want at times. That's not the case for, for a lot of people um, in this journey of, of understanding diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's important again for us as leaders to help people move through that, to gain that muscle strength, that muscle memory to push past the shame um, and, and continue the fight. But then it's also important to not, not let the pendulum swing too far the other way, which is self-righteousness. This entire idea of us versus them, good versus bad. I'm woke, you're not. I'm blue, you're red. There's just so much polarization right now in our country. And it's really, really dangerous to have this movement towards self-righteousness because it puts the focus in the wrong place. It puts the focus on people. And I think in, when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's not so much about people. Uh, next slide, please. We ultimately wanna get move people on this journey toward awakening and realizing that the fight is not simply about seeking diversity. I mean, it'd be awesome to see our organizations represent and be more representative of the communities that we serve, but that's not just it. It's truly, the fight's truly about dismantling systemic white supremacy, this idea that there is a certain group that is superior to others based on their appearance and their heritage. Diversity is a real strong indicator that we're advancing the fight, but I don't think that's the end goal. So it's this constant progression of moving from what do we do to how well do we see, and then recognizing that everyone in our organization is gonna be at different places on that journey and to walk with them through it. So that was a lot, but I'm gonna turn it over to Nikki uh, now to talk a little bit more about what do we do? Where do we go from here? Great, next slide, thanks. So where do we go from here? I, you know, I, as somebody who's been doing this a while, I have noticed there has been such a huge shift in our industry in the last year in um, people accepting that systemic racism is a real thing and that we have some responsibility to address it. Um, yes, there are utilities who've been doing this for many, many years, but there's a lot more utilities and private organizations who really are just starting on their journeys as organizations. And I get the opportunity to talk to a lot of those organizations. And um, I think leaders, it's really hard because people are at all different places on this journey and it's become very politicized. So you have everything from people who are incredibly enthusiastic to people who are adamantly opposed. Um, so as leaders, that's something to navigate. And I just wanted to share some thoughts that I've noticed um, from talking to different organizations. So next slide. So first thing is just, I've noticed there's such a need to create space. There's such a need for processing around this topic, um, whether it's white people who are new to the journey and need to process um, with some people and have a safe space to, to practice, I'd say. Um, and also people who've been doing this for a while, there's also a lot of different feelings from hope and excitement to a lot of frustration. Um, so every time I have a committee meeting or talk to people, I just notice people have just a huge amount of processing need. And a lot of organizations are doing this through book clubs or voluntary discussion groups. I think what's absolutely right about that is making it voluntary and uh, creating that space. Um, you know, one thing is that I've realized is that people need to practice saying white and black with a few people before they feel like they're going to go say that in front of 100 people. And a lot of white people have, a, I was like that too, you know, I grew up in Canada and we didn't have um, very many black people. I was not able to say black uh, probably five years ago. And it was something I had to practice. I mean, someone really did school me and let me do it, let me um, practice just even speaking and talking about it. And I always say one of the purposes of doing equity presentations is just to be like, hey, people can say black and nothing's gonna happen. Um, but I've realized over time that the, realize, the reason why white people don't like saying black is actually because white people hate being called white. So I've never ha encountered a, a time, and not to say it never could happen, but most black people do not mind being called black because you know if you're black in America, you are black every moment of every day. It's not like you have a lot of opportunities to forget that you're black. 
but white people don't have to think about themselves as white sometimes ever. So white people hate being called white. I've, I've encountered so many times when white people have been incredibly offended by being called white and none when black people have been offended by being called black. So for me, I've realized that a lot of our discomfort with it is actually just our discomfort with having race called out at all. So I think this is really important. I think BIPOC people may want to participate, Black, Indigenous, people of color um, may want to participate, but you don't want to set an expectation or um, expect that they're going to lead. Um, next slide. So this is a tension I constantly see in this work is like, how do we experience, uh, honor the experiences of BIPOC people, especially if you're a white leader and you're trying to navigate this world, which is very um, difficult. Um, but also like, how do we do that without expecting BIPOC people to do and staff to do all the work? And I'm especially here talking about things that are uncompensated and unfunded. I've noticed when organizations start an equity initiative, it often starts with a committee. Um, often a BIPOC person is asked to lead that committee, not unusually. Um, or in some, in the worst cases, I feel like they plucked a bunch of BIPOC people through their organization and basically said, we really want you to do this. Um, no budget, no resources, and um, that's not what we want to do. So I think it's this, this challenge. We want to honor the experiences and learn from BIPOC people about their own experiences. However, most of our organizations in the Pacific Northwest do not have a lot of, of brown leaders. So when we especially pick people out of the junior ranks of our organization, which in a lot of our organization is where we do have more brown people, um, it's putting a huge burden on them. And that's not necessarily what they want to do. I say, not every black woman wants to be an equity manager. Some do, and that's great. But, you know, some just want to be CEOs or project managers and a lot of other jobs, just like white people, right? So next slide. So a lot of how to navigate that, I think, is being willing to spend our own organizational capital, especially if you are a white leader. And when I'm talking about organizational capital, I'm talking about that kind of uh, unspoken bank account you have in your organization. So all organizations have values and your bank account kind of goes up when you do good things that your organization values. If you're at a private company, that would be often winning work is the thing that makes your bank account go up the most. And at public organizations, it could be delivering a program. It could be doing something that makes your boss look um, good in the eyes of city council. So all those types of things, you know, doing good things every day. Um, what really makes your capital go down is um, advocating for change tends to be a big downfall. You tend to have to spend a lot of capital to advocate for change. And I say one, I, I used to always say for women, back when I was primarily doing women's leadership, that you kind of need to choose if you want to be a senior leader or if you want to be vocal in the fight. And I feel that's a little bit less true now than it was a few years ago, but there still is some truth to that, that people really had to choose. Because when you're fighting vocally, you spend so much of your capital on that fight, you don't have any capital left over to be promoted. So one thing I feel like leaders can do is lend their own organizational capital to um, to the fight. So what that would mean is maybe if you have a BIPOC person who comes up with an idea um, that you would lend your capital to convincing people to adopt that idea. That could be vocally supporting them, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. Um, so kind of spending your capital to help create that change to try to reduce the burden on that person. So it's something to be really aware of. I, honestly, I look at some organizations, my greatest fear is they've pulled all their brown staff together and asked them to put themselves on the line for the benefit of the organization and that it's actually going to harm the ability of those people to move into the senior ranks at that organization and actually make us go backwards. So next slide. So the other thing I've just realized is that, um, you know, I, I think this fundamental change is really long term. I, I mean, obviously, <laughs> racism isn't new and uh, we're not going to be solving this overnight. It's not like some initiative you do and by 2021, we're all going to be done. So I, I think people have to be willing to engage in this really deep long-term work. But I've also realized like we really need to create quick wins to keep momentum going. So you don't want to be all in either category. And some of the quick wins that people do that are quite easy to implement are things like scholarships for um, historically black colleges or for, um, for people of color going into our industry. It's kind of a pretty easy thing to implement. Um, whereas deep long-term change of how we actually change our cultures to be more inclusive and a place where people are comfortable being different, that they can feel celebrated for being different and not feel the pressure that 
um, to have to be like everybody else or to wish they were like everyone else. That is a long and slow process. So I, I've just realized we really need to think about how do we balance those things out? Don't just go for all the quick wins. Um, I say, don't go for all candy, but you can't go for all kale too. So how do we create that mix? So next slide. So, uh, you know, Rob did say this also, equity is a journey and not a destination. And I think as leaders, it's really hard because it's not a defined process and that you can have initiatives and you can complete them and then there's gonna be more. It's just an endless journey and layers and you're going through your own journey while you're trying to lead other people's on their, people on their journey. So I'll just leave you with a quote from Maya Angelou that, Angelou that I know a lot of people have heard before is, um, do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. So I think that's all we can all try to do. Nikki and Rob, that was fascinating. And um, I'm trying to uh, make sure I don't ask you all of my questions along with all the questions that are coming in. So I, I do have this question and I'll start um, with you, Nikki. Okay. So what are some of those quick wins? Because um, you know a lot of our organizations um, and maybe not a lot, but are starting on our DEI journeys. I'm not starting, but continuing to procure our DEI journeys. And um, what what are some of those quick wins that we can do now what, instead of just waiting till our plans are fully developed? I'll start with you, Nikki, and then I'll go to you, Rob. Um, so when I'm thinking of public agencies, um, I mean, what are often low low hanging fruit or pretty easy things is, you know, outreach is often one that's quite quick for people to, you might not completely overhaul your whole outreach approach, but like just looking at who are you talking to, who's coming to your meetings, um, looking at what communities of color are in your area and starting to um, do outreach with those organizations. And, you know, it, again, the starting point would just be to go maybe offer to do a presentation to them on, on what your utility does. So just starting. So that to me is an example of something that is a thing that you can do quite easily. It's, it's only the tip of the iceberg of what that eventually might be, but it is a thing. And then a lot of private companies in particular are looking at hiring practices. You know, um, a lot of the software systems now that you have for um, managing hiring processes can allow you to do things like take out the identifiers. Um, private companies often have incentives to uh, bring your friends into the company. A lot of companies are looking at getting rid of those because it incentivizes hiring more people that are the same. Those are examples of pretty simple things. And then there's, you know, supporting people getting involved in external organizations and initiatives. Um, there are sometimes, you know, where are you purchasing things from? For a lot of private companies, it can be, what are we doing to support minority and uh, women-owned firms? And those might not sound super simple, but often you can do something as a starting point. You can actually do something as a starting point quite quickly, even though the eventual thing might be much larger and more complicated than that. So, so I, I do encourage people to start. Um, it's okay not to do the perfect thing. It's okay to start and, and you really do have to learn while you're doing it. So it's okay to start doing things, see how they go, and then keep advancing it as you go along. That's great, Rob. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, this journey is such a relational thing. And as engineers, scientists mm -hmm. in the water industry, we tend to think of things more as transactions. And so I would say uh, organizations can really focus on the relationships. Um, it's amazing even when you, you, some of the work that I'm doing now that's completely different from this, it's that entire idea of seeing things through another person's lens and how much that changes that as a wastewater engineer, if I could start looking through a natural systems lens, how much more better would I appreciate the work that is being done in those different, those different areas. Um, and, you know, they say, um, you know, I grew up with this idea that uh, we're supposed to run away from those things that are bad. Um, like we're supposed to avoid those situations that are bad, the, the areas that we don't want to go to. And I think in the topic of diversity and, and racial and social justice, we need to flip that mentality. We actually need to start moving toward those things that have historically and systemically been labeled as bad and, and encounter that personally. Trevor Noah said this once in his book, um, you know, Born a Crime. And he just, he said, if, if people could see the actual human impact of racism. He doesn't believe that people would be racist that because they would see how much it impacts individuals. And, and so I would say that for a quick win is find ways to put a human face to this topic, um, whether it's going to the bad situation, the bad situations, or even the people who are different, who might be willing to speak and share their experiences. I think that really changes a lot. 
That's fascinating. And you mentioned resources. Um, we've got tons of them coming through in the chat. So we're almost out of time right now. So I want to be fair to and hearing from both of you. So I wonder if just really quickly, do you have any other resources that you guys can recommend really quick? And if not, that's fine. And just want to let everybody know they can speak with you more in the chat. But do you have any other resources you guys would like to recommend? Nikki? I will say I, because I have a middle school kid, I think there's an amazing resource out there in middle school books because there's something about how middle school books explain the personal experience mm -hmm. in a way that's somehow more impactful a lot of the time than adult books talking about adult experiences. So there's the book New Kid that's about, you know, a black kid in a white school. El Defo um, is about a, a hearing impaired kid. Um, I'm trying to think some of the other ones because I wasn't prepared for this question, but no, there's, a, there's a whole slew of them. And I, I mean, I've read them with my kids and I will say these are books that kids love because they're great books. It's not like taking medicine or something. And I, I just feel like those have been impactful to me because um, because the way that the experience in middle school is so pure somehow. I don't know. <laughs> no, that's great. That's perfect. I, that's great. And that's, that's, that's good. It's a good suggestion. So Rob, do you have any other ones? The only thing I would say, because this is such a fatiguing journey and because we don't often have a whole lot of strength to keep going and, and those of us with privilege who can put it down, find maybe some ways to be educated, but also be entertained. So Netflix is amazing. Um, the documentary 13th, uh, but there's so much good material out there that sometimes it's not as easy as mind candy as watching, um, you know, an Avengers movie, but it can be really, really good information. So um, Netflix, Google, just, but force yourself just to get over that little fatigue hump and keep going. That's great. And you tell where we're at. It's all it's all graphic novels and uh, movies. <laughs> That's right. Edutainment, right? Whatever works. That's good. Meet people where they are. Right? So, so Nikki and Robin, fortunately, we're out of time. Yeah. We will see you right during the Zoom chats mm -hmm. at the end yes. or Zoom meetings. So thank you so much. This was wonderful. Okay, folks, what we'll do is we'll take a little, little, little break and we'll be back here at 10 o'clock for our next session. Thank you.